Tell us a little bit about yourself and also describe the duties in your current job. Sure. Um, Jim Balshi, I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer for the St. Luke's University Health Network. Uh, we are um, in northeastern Pennsylvania, and we are currently a 12 hospital system with about 15,000 employees and roughly 2 million patient visits a year. Um, I am uh, uh, the, the network information officer for um, the IT department. I have a background in vascular surgery and I've practiced at our institution for about 35 years. My current uh, role is really to uh, apply the medical and clinical side of information technology. We oversee the, the electronic medical record. We're an Epic shop, uh, as well as the integration of all the devices into the electronic medical record. Uh, we oversee the predictive analytics in our analytics uh, enterprise, enterprise data warehouse, as well as our, our uh, Epic database uh, in utilizing artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. Um, and I'm also involved with the innovations uh, team in introducing new technologies to the organization. Thank you very much, James. So the next panelist is uh, Robert. Uh, Robert, what can you tell us about yourself? And also, can you describe the duties in your current job? Sure, good morning. Um, so my name is Rob Stillman. I'm the Director of Clinical and Research in, uh, Informatics at the Ohio State University uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center, more specifically. Uh, I am a nurse by background, an oncology nurse, and I've been in healthcare for uh, over 25 years now. Um, I uh, started my career uh, as a military nurse, actually, uh, and have been involved uh, in some form or fashion with uh, health IT over the course of my uh, time as both a, a, a clinician and administrator and now full-time as a uh, uh, leader um, within informatics. Um, my role is really uh, to be a clinical liaison between my, our health IT colleagues uh, and both our researchers and our clinical staff. And so I spend a lot of time uh, recommending um, uh, processes and technology to my administrative uh, counterparts and also uh, playing the go-between often between uh, our, our IT colleagues and, and others. So I'm, I'm probably the least IT person here. Uh, uh, I don't take care of patients anymore, but um, uh, but I spend a lot of time working with clinicians to make sure that they understand uh, a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about on this panel today. Uh, I also um, am very, very actively involved in uh, HIMSS and, sp and actually am the chair of the uh, credentialing committee for those of you who are familiar with the CP HIMSS. Uh, CAM's uh, credentials. So that's a little bit about myself. Thank you very much, Robert. So the next speaker, next panelist is Tracy Hughes. Tracy, um, she's the only lady on our panel. Uh, what can you tell us about yourself? And also, can you describe your duties uh, in your current job? Sure. Hey, I am Tracy Hughes. I'm the Senior Director for Clinical Engineering for Duke Health. And um, in my role here, and just a little bit about background, I've been in the field of clinical engineering for a little over 30 years and uh, spent a good portion of that at, with a third party organization that contracted um, to hospitals to provide the services. Um, that was Aramark uh, Healthcare, uh, now Trimedics and actually had a stint here at Duke um, with them. I've been back here at Duke now for about nine years and again, oversee the clinical engineering management program here for Duke Health. Um, we have over a little over 55,000 assets um, active in our inventory today. And we actually report up through the um, IT group, our Duke Health Technology Solutions group here. 
and um, it is a, a beautiful relationship and we're really glad to kind of be a part of that. I report up to the COO. So on a, on a daily basis, I would have uh, probably challenged that I was the least IT here, um, but over the last probably five to 10 years, that's really changed. Um, our, our world is evolving and we take more of a role. So here lately, and as, as we kind of get into the conversation today, a lot of my time is spent kind of in this cybersecurity realm and, and looking at how our equipment, um, that we're protecting the, the risk, for the organization, that we're keeping the equipment up and serviceable for the departments. Obviously, in the, in the more traditional clinical engineering role, we are asset management inventory, kind of cradle to grave. We take the equipment as it comes into the organization, uh, maintain that inventory. We're keeping regulatory compliance. Um, managing incidents, tracking trends and failures, um, recalls, and, and managing that piece of it. But now we have this IT component. Probably 30 to 35% of our devices now are connected and on the network. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I go back through. Uh, my background is I have a bachelor's in biomedical engineering and recently completed my master's in uh, management of clinical informatics here at Duke. Thank you very much, Tracy. Our next panelist is Seth Fogi, who is one of our own at Penn. He is our Director of Information Technology. Seth, uh, can you, what can you tell us about yourself and can you describe the duties in your current job? Sure, um, uh, you know, as the slide indicates there, I've got like 20 plus years of experience in uh, technical security uh, background with uh, some of the ethical hacking type of perspective on security. Um, 10 plus years of my background have been strictly in healthcare where I got to see a lot of the, the challenges um, and the, the difficulties and uh, just the fun of trying to secure some of this uh, legacy uh, biomedical uh, equipment that's out there, which is you know one of the reasons why we're having this conversation now. Um, as part of that background, I've done a lot of speaking and, and writing and researching within the security field. Um, uh, like I'm um, also a veteran of the U.S. Navy, uh, was in the nuclear field there, um, was transitioned into a workforce education degree, and then uh, got my master's in information technology. So I enjoy the speaking, I enjoy the engaging, I enjoy uh, trying to understand and relay that information uh, up and down and throughout the organization from operations to technical. Uh, and uh, Penn Medicine, my responsibilities are specifically around the mostly the engineering arm of the security program that involves all the, the assessments, um, the technical assessments. It involves the, the equipment that's used to protect, the processes used to protect, a lot of the break fix parts of it. So uh, when it comes to the, the biomedical uh, relationship there, there's a, there's a tight integration, especially right now. And this is, I mean, this is a really good time for, the, for this conversation to occur um, because it, biomedical is getting a lot of that security focus and, and especially Penn Medicine. We're, we're actively in the middle of um, implementing segmentation and and trying to get an understanding of the biomedical devices there and proof of concepting, looking at solutions to help us get inventory understanding as well as vulnerability understanding of our of our environments. So this is a this is a great and meaningful conversation um, for myself. Uh, it, just being part of this is helpful for uh, working toward the future. Thank you very much, Seth. And the last member of the panel and the moderator is myself, Benoit Desjardins. I am Associate Professor of Radiology and Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. So I am an active clinician taking care of patients. I read, you know, uh, images um, all day long and perform, you know, imaging procedures. Um, I've, my background is uh, in AI and computer science and mathematics. Uh, I also run a lab here that's NIH funded in uh, uh, cardiovascular imaging uh, involving a lot of IT stuff. I've played a lot of key IT roles throughout my career as a radiologist. Uh, in radiology, we're really equipment intensive, the most equipment intensive field in medicine. Uh, we deal with workstations all the time. We rarely see real patients live. We interact through them via images seen on computers. Uh, I also have an extensive expertise in cybersecurity. I have a couple of certifications in the field and I've been working closely with our team here at Penn in cybersecurity, including you know, Seth, 
uh, every two weeks we do uh, some uh, hacking challenges to help his team grow in skills and I kind of uh, help them um, you know evolve and we also have this like oh internal competition that is always nice uh, <laughs> to see which one of me or set will will finish first um, but it's it's really fun okay that's it for the panel introduction uh, the main topics that we're going to cover today our, our main area of concern is healthcare and security issues. Um, how medical centers can prepare for the realities of a rapidly evolving 21st century medicine. Uh, we'll address issues such as interoperability, clinical informatics, biomedical operations, and security. We will focus on five key issues and use the expertise of our diverse panelists to address those issues. First, we'll talk about inventory, how to identify the devices and systems that are part of a medical institution. Second, we'll discuss how to secure each of those devices and systems uh, how, and how secure they are and how to secure them. This includes initial assessment of security, maintenance of security through updates and patches, and compliance with institutional risk management strategies. Third, we will address how these devices and systems can interoperate safely. These devices are often from different vendors and they need to interact safely with each other as part of the normal operations in a medical center. Fourth, we will discuss how to handle new devices and systems before and after purchase. Finally, we will discuss how to retire devices and systems either temporarily or permanently while making sure all the protected health information is removed from those devices. So that's it for the slides. I will, this is our general plan again, and then I'll stop sharing and we'll go over the panelist pictures. Okay, everybody is there, excellent. <laughs> so the first topic we're gonna to talk about is what devices and systems do we have? And the first question is obviously about inventory. Before we figure out how to protect medical systems and devices, we need to identify what devices and systems a hospital owns. Uh, healthcare systems typically own tens of thousands of medical devices and systems. Making a simple inventory of those devices and systems is a massive and non-trivial task. What are the best approaches to do this formidable task? And how do you personally do it at your institutions? I believe that Tracy has a lot of insights on that topic. Thanks, Benoit. Um, sure. The, you know, I'm going to say kind of up front that inventory, be it biomedical or otherwise, is probably the key um, as you go across the board. The ability to have um, the transparency and see what is in your system at any point in time and especially connected to our networks is, is really, really important. Um, we come from a place in the clinical engineering world and HTM where um, inventory has always been thought of as a very kind of a physical um, aspect to a piece of equipment. Whenever the device comes in, we take down the, the model, the serial number, manufacturer, all the information, we complete the tests on it. And, and the concept and the thought that there were these other items, operating system levels, um, patch versions, um, you know, whether a system was embedded or not, the MAC, the IP, the closet, all of that was fairly, I mean, that was something that biomeds weren't typically trained um, how to do. So there's a big skill gap right now, it, even out there today in um, different shops that when equipment comes in, is all of that information being gathered? And even if it is, do the technicians know how and where on each piece of equipment to gather that information? Um, it makes it really important to work with vendors. Uh, the software bill of materials is really important, um, but a lot of places don't, don't provide that. So you kind of, you're kind of starting out out of the gate uh, missing some important pieces of information. And for a lot of shops and places that are out there, this information isn't there. And so in order to gather it, it really requires having kind of a, 
a physical inventory approach where you're going back out and touching all of these pieces of equipment to kind of collect that uh, information. Are there any tools that you can use to help with inventory management? Sure. Um, yeah, we've, we've actually, we're really excited right now. There are lots of, uh, lots of different vendors and again, no advertisements here for any of them, but there, we've come a long way in that there are passive scanning tools that are out there that can help you understand and provide that uh, visibility to your inventory, to those connected devices. Uh, here at Duke, we're actually uh, through a proof of concept and, and into full-blown implementation of one of those tools. And, and again, it provides us that link that, that we had been missing. I can still see all of my equipment, uh, the manufacturer, the model, it, it connects, really the connection for us has been around that serial number piece that puts it there, but then it's also giving us all of this other really rich information about the, uh, again, MAC IPs, operating system levels, whether there's endpoint security attached, you know, any of the information that we have on it. So it's been a very, very powerful tool. It's an expensive tool. So it's a proposition for most health systems. If you're going to have to set a, an ROI, um, but again, the cases are there. Most of these tools also offer some utilization information that can, can help uh, kind of sweeten the deal, so to speak. Uh, but if you take a look at the time that's spent in having to physically go out and find and, and being blind to really kind of what your risk is, it really helps build the case for one of these tools, implementing them in your system. And can you provide a small example about the kinds of problems you're dealing with in the determination of inventory? Yeah, so, so again, kind of, I think as Seth had mentioned, it's an interesting time right now. Uh, in the world that we have with the, with the most current threat that's come to us. Uh, it's, it's caused, um, I think Seth was mentioning again about segmentation and they were working on it in his, his place. At ours, we're looking at turning on um, and enforcing uh, network access control, so our NAC solution. And before we can do that, you have to identify all of the items. You have to be able to register these devices in NAC. And so we had this huge um, rogue list, I guess, if you will, of devices and things that were out there. And really in order for us to be able to turn on that enforcement at the switch level, we had to identify those, those pieces of equipment. And for us, that, that tool, our passive uh, inventory scanning tool, our, our view into it helped us. I mean, immediately we were able to type in a MAC address that was showing as a rogue and identify it as a certain piece of equipment. And then even from there, be able to tell kind of what the adapter was. So it was a really, really powerful and timely um, exercise that we were able to show value back. Thanks so very much. I think we've talked uh, about inventory enough and we're ready to move to the second topic. So the second topic is, you know, how secure is each device and system and an institution? And that will have three parts. The first part is the initial assessment of security. So now that we know how to make an inventory of the devices and systems in a healthcare system, the next question to address is how to initially assess the security of these devices and system. Whose job is it to do that? I believe that Robert, you had some ideas about that. Yeah, so, you know, again, I work very, very closely with clinical staff and uh, their knowledge of security is really totally dependent on, uh, you know, folks like Tracy and, and Seth um, the, the, to, to really ensure the safety and security of the equipment that's being used at the bedside. And it's not something, quite frankly, that is generally considered, uh, unless you're someone like Benoit, who does this as a side gig uh, for our, our clinical um, folks, they just want the equipment there. They want to make sure that it works and they're less interested about the security. Although I think a lot of that is kind of coming out in the news now. Um, you know, one just quick comment I have to something that Tracy mentioned was mentioning in, in kind of the inventory management that's somewhat related is the ability to find equipment for clinical staff is critically important, uh, especially I think during this uh, uh, day and age where we're looking at uh, inventory of, of ventilators, of pumps and things like that. And so I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of that inventory management. Um, 
but again, I, I don't think that our clinical staff, they just, they, they want to make, they want to know that it's working uh, and they want to make sure that they have it when it's needed. They're less worried about the security component of it and assume that uh, others are managing that. Thank you. And, and what mechanisms can you use to help for initial assessment of security of devices and systems and perform a risk ranking of devices and systems? I believe Tracy and James had some ideas on that. Ladies first. Thanks. Um, again, we're we're heavily reliant on um, the tools that, that we've implemented and putting those into place. Um, aside from that, you need to have a very clear, as you're bringing equipment in, understanding from the vendor of what their patching schedule is, how they approve it, where you go to find the information on patches that are released. It's a challenging environment because, again, in many cases, um, endpoint agents are not allowed on the, the medical devices. And so you're in a situation where you're not able to broadly push patches, and it involves, again, um, a fair amount of physical resources and, and labor and effort. So just understanding, I think, again, where and how those items are available to you. And then for us, again, having our, our tool that we can go in and see what level that we're at and then kind of matching that up with current risks that are out there. Um, it helps us prioritize, you know, where we're putting our effort in terms of getting those, uh, those patches done. You have to be very careful and work. It's not, we run into from a vulnerability scanning standpoint. Again, a lot of times the medical devices are in use and constantly kind of being used. And it's not the kind of thing you want to introduce a, a scan um, at an inopportune time and possibly take a piece of equipment down. So again, there's a lot of um, coordination and um, collaboration with our IT partners to look at and develop times when that can be done. Some of that's done in lab settings. Um, like I think you guys talked about, you know, kind of doing the, the hacking exercises to try and find that out. And, and again, it's putting things like that into play. Thank you. And what about you, James? You have some ideas on that? Yeah, some great comments, uh, Tracy. Thank you. I, you know, I, I think I introduced myself as being part of a 12 hospital system. And, and I'm sure most, most of us are, are uh, involved in organizations that are multi-entity um, and oftentimes those entities operate somewhat independently um, and you know you'll have a, a, a campus president who uh, needs to have a certain uh, new device and they they bring it in and and um, uh, expect everything to work perfectly and I, I think it's a challenge for healthcare organizations to uh, build a process because we're busy taking care of patients to manage the influx of equipment um, in, in a way that's organized and reduces or mitigates risk. Um, and unfortunately, this industry uh, does not have any level of security standardization. We have it around a lot of software, but we don't have it for hardware. Um, and, you know, it would be nice if every device um, had some sort of underwriter's laboratory certificate of, of security, um, but that doesn't exist in the, in the hardware industry. So we have to rely on um, trying to build processes that at least address things up front as much as possible. So we... we um, try to chronically uh, ask new devices, new software, new processes, SAAS, um, to go through a security assessment before we bring it on board to the network. And I think, I think that should be um, job one in information technology departments to establish that across these, these multi-site places where a lot of times um, the, the organizational uh, hierarchy of process is not as nice or as clean as we would like it. Um, but really, uh, when we get to the IoT department, um, where we're bringing in thousands of devices, whether it's a pulse oximeter or a hemoglobin monitor or a laser or a, or a, um, a new MRI, uh, we really don't, we have, and, and this came up in the prior talk uh, by Mike Ahmad, 
we have to rely on the manufacturer for some level of security. And there really is no process of certifying that or assessing that. So I like to watch cop shows on Netflix and, and, and um, they, they frequently bring up the, the concept of, of chain of custody. And couldn't we as an industry develop uh, a process that ensures us that the device manufacturer has uh, gone to great lengths to secure that, that the motherboard they purchased, the chips they purchased, the hardware, the, uh, the, the drive, the capacitors, uh, that these all have security level assessments uh, that they're buying good equipment. I, I'm old enough to remember Stuxnet and, and that was the, um, the NSA's uh, implanted malware that disabled the Iranian centrifuges. Um, and, and this is sort of the, the nightmare that I have with IoT that, you know, our creative malicious individuals um, are going to find a way into the hardware chain. And how will we know that when GE builds this massive MRI that has a gazillion parts that those parts have a secure chain of custody so that we're not built, we're not, you know, plugging in a system that has 43 different buried malware processes. And I, I think this is a challenge for the healthcare space to build that, that process. In the meantime, we have to, we have to rely on technology like we're all talking about today, which can monitor and look for those voices of destruction that can uh, penetrate our networks and take us down. And, um, you know, it, it goes beyond the MRI or the, or the pulse oximeter to everybody walking in with their cell phones. And, and uh, we're, now, we're now stressing our, our firewalls with, um, with thousands of different approaches, all of which could put us in the front page of the New York Times as the next network that went down for ransomware. So it's a challenge. And, and uh, I hope that the industry evolves. Um, and I will give one shout out to the, the uh, 21st Century Cures Act, which we all are dealing with. It's the first time that we've actually set a real standard for integration or interoperability. And hopefully that will expand and grow. Um, and it, it does take the government to do that. Thank you very much, James. So uh, can you give us some specific examples on assessing security of specific devices and system in a healthcare system? And I believe that Seth had some great comments on that. Yeah, um, it, it's it's tough sitting here just to listen to all the commentary going on and and not even jump in and, and try and just there's some you know my my perspective on this is from a very technical point of view and having to assess a lot of these applications and there's like there's things that have been brought up by each of the panelists so far that um, really drive this home from the Cures Act which you know that that effectively turns the the many customer devices out there the consumer devices into an extension of the, the IoT problem. Um, then there's, you know, the, the challenges that, that Tracy's dealing with and you know, her focus is on, on biomed IoT, but from my perspective, there's twice as much IoT on the network than what she's dealing with because there's HVAC, there's cameras, there's not just the biomed, but there's all the rad IT, the card IT that probably doesn't fall into Tracy's you know, domain. Um, and, and there's just, the world just, is so big from an IoT perspective. Um, so uh, another challenge that, that kind of was touched on is the, how do you, what tools, um, and I saw on the chat on the side there, what tools do people use? Um, and it's almost, it's really difficult to find the right tool. Uh, they're expensive and they're complex. Um, and we're kind of sitting in a unique position right now because we're in, a, in, a, in the best of worlds and the worst of worlds. Uh, vendors, some vendors are catching up. And they're doing things like encrypting their communication between the IoT device and the, the back end. Um, and I know we're going to get the integration a little bit later, but when you do that, it, it starts to 
neutralize the effect of the tools because they can't see inside the traffic anymore. So now you can't even tell what the device is. Um, where the legacy devices, they're so challenging in their own way. Uh, yeah, you can see what's on the network. You can understand the vulnerabilities. You can understand exactly what's going on, but you can't scan it because if you scan it, it's going to fall over. And now you've got a, a patient issue. So um, from the from from my perspective, where I'm operating vulnerability scanners, we we have to be very careful about what we scan. Um, so we do a lot manually. Uh, I have like two examples that, that come to mind here. And one kind of touches on the, the Cures Act where we have to open things up. Most healthcare organizations have a patient portal. They need the patient portal to be available to, uh, to their patients. And you know the, the idea is that most patients stick within a geographic central location and they access that one patient portal, but students are not within that mold. Um, students may, you know, depending on their, their life situation, they may have parents in different locations of the world. Then they have the school. They might have other, other situations. You know, they might do an internship or a job. They can be dealing with two, three, four different patient care systems, depending on who the student is. So uh, by, by law, we have to extend the healthcare system out to custom apps that are on mobile phones, um, which is almost, I mean, it's an, it's an IoT device of a different sort. And there's vendors that fit in that gap that, that allow you to connect to the different healthcare systems. And they help bridge that gap by taking your credentials and serving as that, that kind of single sign-on pathway into there and bringing that data to you. A valuable resource. It's something that will help students keep track of everything. But those credentials are now in the, in the hands of a third party. So you're trusting that third party to keep them secure. And I know from, a, from looking at some of these applications that it's just not secure. In fact, some of these vendors store those credentials in plain text in their environment. So now it's not just a IoT device issue, it's a credential storing issue, it's a privacy issue. If that third party database gets compromised, who's holding the reputational uh, you know, baggage on that one? Uh, it's probably not gonna be just that company, it's gonna be any of the, the, the organizations that are uh, exposed as well. Um, and that's just one example. Another one that, that comes to mind is, uh, again, it, it illustrates the challenge beyond just biomed and the consumer world is the uh, uh, patient entertainment systems. Um, I know of two systems that we've looked at in the past uh, where uh, effectively the, the IoT component of it was completely vulnerable. Um, one system was effectively exposed to the internet to the point that anybody with the right URL could uh, connect to a patient's TV and send it to whatever channel they wanted to, and not to mention that, but they could also send the TV to whatever web page they wanted to. So think about, you know, some person in a, uh, you know, some miscreant out there, a kid that, that wants to create chaos could easily uh, scan through this particular solution, find all the open portals and send them all to a specific website that may not be all that pleasant to view. Um, things like that are just, you know, that kind of a, illustrate some of the, not just security, but also patient facing challenges. Um, and finally, another patient uh, facing application, it's a, it's a solution that is designed to allow a doctor or, or whoever to, to send data to the patient screen. It's a great idea, um, but in this case, the, the solution was put together in such a way that, that the IoT device of it, piece of it, didn't do any authentication. All the authentication was on the client end. The client not only generated the authentication key, but it self-validated itself, which is a very bad security model. Um, you don't want to have somebody, if a hacker got a hold of that application, they could effectively create the key and validate their own key and connect to the patient's portal. Um, and then uh, to, to uh, drive home another point that was mentioned, we can present these uh, vulnerabilities and issues to uh, the vendors, but the vendors may not be able to or have the resources to remediate them, which also now, now we have the challenge of what do we do to secure it and you know, how, do we, how do we prevent that from being compromised? I'll stop there and move on. Thank you very much. So after the initial assessment of security for devices and systems is completed, you need to maintain security for those systems. New vulnerabilities are discovered every day and new patches are issued every week. Uh, what's the best way to handle that? And I believe that James had some ideas on that. Yeah, again, this goes back to large healthcare organizations tend to be you know, our favorite uh, uh, 
sort of um, example is herding cats where we're busy doing a lot of patient care and uh, something new comes along and we try to uh, quickly incorporate it because it's an advantage for patient care. Uh, and then ratcheting back the deployment of this new technology because we want to have institutional control and governance over this is extremely difficult. Getting people to say, okay, we'll put the brakes on here because we need to have a process that works across all of our in institution. Um, so to me, this is the challenge of the CIO uh, in, in any large organization is to be able to rein in the, the constant uh, churning and addition of new equipment, new software, new pro uh, processes, and, and to be able to set some standard that will allow us to, um, that will allow us to be uh, in control of this by, uh, for instance, setting policy around cadence of updates. Um, you know, are we, how many versions behind is my organization? Um, because that, every time we're a version behind, I think that exposes us to, to more vulnerability. Um, so setting that policy, and that's expensive as Tracy uh, brought up earlier, Sometimes these policies cost us upfront and it's very hard to demonstrate an ROI when you're just trying to prevent a problem. <laughs> um, there's, there's usually not a revenue uh, stream um, with things working well uh, that we can just you know, um, carve out from things that aren't working well. So it's, it's a challenge from an organizational and a management standpoint to build um, cadence and to build scheduling to avoid version lag and patch procrastination, uh, as we like to call it. Uh, but it does bring, I think, a level of operational excellence to um, to be on time and and not letting your organization fall behind. Thank you for systems for which no updates are provided from vendors. How would you handle their security? And I believe Seth had some comments on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll use this with another another example of a system we found in our organization. Um, it was a temperature monitoring system. It's a it's a after doing the assessment, we discovered that the monitoring system was basically an off the shelf operating system install onto a device that allowed it to collect data from the monitoring the temperature devices and and submit them back to a back end server. Um, poking out a little bit, we found that the, the website was had a had a password of the day. Um, the code viewable by just viewing the source of the, the HTML page of the, the web interface of this device um, actually exposed the, the, the administrator cookie value that you could set and just gain instant administrator access to the temperature control device. And from there, there were vulnerabilities in the web app that allowed you to get full root access to the device effectively. Um, and you know, to complicate it more, the, this device talked to a backend system, um, which helped manage the various different temperature solutions or temperature devices out there. And the backend solution also had a major vulnerability where you could dump the administrator's usernames and passwords and plain text. So now you have a completely vulnerable IoT front end to the, the edge devices and then the, the backend system as well. So you know, we're looking at our options. We talked to the vendor and the vendor basically says, uh, yeah, sorry, there's not much we can do. Um, and that's not an uncommon response with these medical devices because they're either legacy outdated. Um, I mean, I think probably the panel here could probably relate to this and that it almost feels like sometimes the vendors just want us to upgrade because there's a, there's a nice price tag associated with those upgrades instead of remediating the old stuff. Um, speculation, but you know, I think most of us can have that same sentiment. Um, still, uh, you know, going back to the vendor, there was nothing on the table that we could get from the vendor from an update perspective. So we literally had to basically containerize the application with the segmentation um, solution that that went from the front to the back and isolated everything. And and, and that's you know that is not an abnormal type of approach for this, which is why segmentation and NAC are 
often the two, uh, unfortunately, sledgehammer approaches that we have to implement and, you know, do what James was saying, they're not fun. They are not easy to do. It's an organizational hit. And there's a lot of hardware, software, resource time to implement something like that across the entire board. Thank you, Seth. Uh, let's move to another subtopic. Um, in the process of securing devices and systems, we must make sure to comply with the risk management strategies of our respective institutions. How does one approach this problem? And I believe Tracy had some comments on that. Um, I think it's really about um, understanding, you know, everybody's kind of talked about it here. It's working with the vendors as much as we can, putting them in a position where they um, need to work with us to establish uh, standards, how they're going to approach this, that they provide us with this information up front. Um, beyond that, it's, it's having um, a risk ranking system. So again, within the clinical engineering uh, world, we've always um, ranked equipment kind of and given it a priority based on what the function of the device was, what would happen if it were to fail while it was on a patient. And now implementing this IT security um, risk element to it to understand, does it have PHI? What, you know, what's the risk to the organization? You, you add that element in, and then you start taking a look at when these um, threats and, and different things come out there, you have to have a way to be able to go back across your inventory, again, why inventory is so important, um, and assess kind of, you know, based on that risk factor, understanding um, how the devices communicate uh, what what patch level, you know, marrying all of those pieces of information together to understand the overall kind of risk picture and then tackling tackling that. Thank you. Uh, let's now move to the interoperation of devices. So now, now that we know how to assess the security of individual systems and devices and how to maintain it in a changing environment, Another important problem we need to discuss is the interoperation of devices and systems. Two devices from different vendors can be very secure by themselves, but their interaction might be difficult and insecure. How can we ensure that devices and systems interoperate safely and continue to interoperate safely through security updates? I believe that Robert had some ideas on that. So I, I wish I had the answer on on the how, but I think the the uh, the the why is pretty 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 clear. And and James alluded to this, but I think we really need to have some sort of national standard for interoperability. And and obviously, I think the 21st Cares uh, Act gets us there. Um, and vendors need to be held to that standard. They need to be held accountable to that. And again, I agree that it's probably the government and, and regulation that's going to have to push that. Um, and we need to be able to do that securely and efficiently um, and to, to really, you know, take the burden off of our health IT professionals uh, within our healthcare system. Um, you know, we're constantly bombarded by by new requests for equipment from our clinical staff, you know, for the, the, the betterment of patient care. And it, it, it's in all facets of what we do, but the ability to be able to implement and put these things into practice is very, very challenging for all the reasons that have been mentioned behind. And, and again, if you're in an academic medical center where you're sort of at the forefront of these things, it, it's really frustrating to our clinicians and researchers that they can't do these and, you know, uh, you know, Seth and Tracy and those that have to do these security risk assessments and those sorts of things get get kind of beat up over this. Uh, um, so we also need to really consider that, the, you know, the at the at the bedside and in integration with uh, the electronic medical record. Um, there's a heavy reliance on our clinical staff, and I can give you an example, for example, of IV pump integration, uh, barcode medication, barcode medication administration. Uh, we have positive patient ID for uh, laboratory specimen collection and barcode and blood administration, um, in addition to like BMDI for vent settings and, and other monitoring. And, you know, our staff under need to understand uh, I think you all do on this panel for sure, but our clinical staff need to understand that, you know, that that a security breach of this can be very, very serious in 
and I think in the last talk it was alluded to, can, can actually injure or uh, e even uh, cause uh, death in, in patients. And um, again, I'm, I, I'm appealing to my clinical staff constantly that security breaches of these devices uh, and their own risky behavior can put their patients at risk. Um, and again, I, I hate to keep referring to our current crisis, but you know it's particularly important when we are at capacity uh, and to have our networks breached uh, for any reason at that point would put all of these things that we rely on. I'm old enough that I charted on paper uh, and uh, I expect that James and, and Benoit probably are too. <laughs> Uh, just by hair color, uh, but uh, you know we have many nurses and, and physicians who uh, who have not trained an environment without these integrations and without these EMRs. And so, uh, again, that that standard for interoperability, but that standard for security, I think, is really relevant and important. I, hey Ben, well, can I just jump in on something here? Because of course. I, I think this is an area that we have really uh, started to struggle with. We're, we're seeing more, um, is Bluetooth going to be okay? Is RFID going to be okay? Um, you know, and there is near field, um, you know, the way I do my Apple Pay. Is that, is that going to be okay? And we're starting to see more and more of these, um, these bridges that we hadn't dealt with before. I mean, Obviously, if everything's hardwired, we got a little bit more control over that. But now we're dealing with, um, you know, new technologies coming around, uh, even in the last year. And boy, that's that's a, a worry for us. Definitely. Um, can you provide specific examples of either obvious or non-obvious of interoperation of devices and how the function of a device can impact? the function of other devices at a healthcare institution. And I believe that Seth had some thought about that. Yeah, um, uh, there's one situation that comes to mind and this is a, an HVAC situation that I, that I was aware of um, occurred uh, in the past. Uh, you wouldn't think that a switch, a simple little IoT switch would, would have much of an impact, but um, if that switch is in a, a certain, you know, a, in a place where an HVAC system sits behind it and the HVAC system can't now communicate to the rest of the organization's devices that control temperature monitoring, uh, well, you could have a major problem. Um, many people may not realize that, that you, know, you have medical devices, which are very patient centric. They're obviously tied to a patient, sometimes very literally in a patient sometimes, um, and they have the obvious, you know, if you that device goes down, it could impact a patient. Then you have an HVAC system, most people just take for granted. You walk into an organization, the air is cool, the air is warm, whatever. Um, but that that HVAC system is ma managing the humidity of environment. And if that humidity goes outside of a certain variance, it starts to impact some real world uh, healthcare related activities such as operating operations. Um, or operate, operating system environments um, where the, you know, the pads have to be kept at a sterile specific humidity and, and a lot of the other equipment in there has to be uh, managed at a very specific humidity. So if the HVAC system goes down, you now have a very humid environment and it could end up uh, impacting operations in a way that most people would never even think about. Um, and I'll also jump in with a, a, I mean, it's a little bit different of a twist about the this, this climate we're in, and you know, we have the COVID crisis going on, but in the last uh, two weeks or so, uh, there's been an escalated awareness around uh, healthcare. It's been in the news that healthcare systems are being targeted and attacked. And you know, this isn't an IoT specific, but it's a good example because there's lots of workflows in our organizations that have been built around uh, newer technologies, um, cloud-based technologies, cloud solutions, and people have been designing kind of an engineering in a way, their own workflows. So uh, things like, like Google Docs, you know, people use it, webmail, people use it. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of this challenges with COVID, but people needing to communicate with schools and stuff. So webmail is an important element to personal um, and even work-related activities. But the healthcare security, um, challenge showed up, the, the raise of awareness. And I think most organizations, if not all organizations, asked the question, 
should we block webmail now? Because we know it's being used to, to infiltrate organizations. And for the most part, I think most organizations said, yeah, we're just gonna block it and it may be temporary, but we've got to figure something out in the long run. And that kind of brings you, you know, to the other point of security. It's really, 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 really hard for security to say no and actually just, just deny something. That doesn't usually happen. What more often happens is a control or something will be put in place. And, and that's where the operations and inter, the interoperability becomes even more significant is what kind of controls or ways can we mitigate the risk that's being introduced by a certain thing? What can we do with it instead of just saying no? Well, it's almost a given rule that when you do put one of those, those mitigation controls in, then you discover what you stopped. Yeah, you know, exactly. Oh, we didn't realize, you know, because we can never think of every implication of, of what we do. And those responses, it's why we try to be as proactive as possible, but it's, it's really challenging. Yeah, definitely. So let's move to a new topic. So the next topic we'll address is about new devices and systems. Technology constantly evolves and hospitals buy hundreds of new pieces of equipment every year, from simple infusion devices to large MRI units. It's important to be able to assess security of those devices before they are purchased and to assess their security right after their arrival. What's the best way to do that? I believe Robert had some ideas on that. You're on mute. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I, again, I wish I had like the, the, the answer to, to Benoit's question, um, <laughs> uh, but, but I don't. Um, it's, it's challenging. I deal um, far less with devices uh, than I do kind of this, the, these questions about interoperability. Um, and again, we are part of a research and academic um, research institution. So we get lots of questions about how do we use, how can we interoperate uh, research functionality and use things like uh, fire standards. Um, and again, each of these requires a security assessment, you know, like that of the equipment. It takes time, and as I mentioned, it's it's you know it's very onerous for the uh, requesting uh, investigators or clinical staff because they're not aware of the uh, technical requirements or the limitations to um, what they're being asked. Oftentimes, it's the vendors that are really pushing on this. If I if there was a way that and I'm sorry for the vendors who are sponsoring this, if we could conduit the vendors towards those of us who, uh, who know how to answer the questions. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a considerable effort placed, at least in, in my area, about who owns uh, the data and the security and who ultimately would be responsible if there was any breach uh, in privacy um, or security. Um, and you know, we also have to, within our research mission, it's a little bit different than what goes on kind of in our, our standard of care world because we have sponsors who are providing equipment to us. Uh, and that may not be under the purview of someone like Seth or Tracy to kind of do that and it's sort of sponsor managed. And so that's something that our own security team here at OSU uh, is, is constantly trying to, to chase down. Um, so it's, it's a challenge for sure. Now, are there standards being developed to assess the security of new medical devices and systems before and after their purchases? And should we restrict the purchasing options to only those devices that are vetted and play well with the other devices already owned by the institution? I believe James had some ideas on that. Well, no one likes to be told, no, you can't do that, especially in healthcare. And, and unfortunately, um, organizations, when they get bigger and bigger and more chaotic and have more people that are requesting something new, um, there, there is this balance that has to be struck. Um, what we have done at St. Luke's is, is tried to uh, standardize the equipment that we're purchasing. So um, uh, for instance, we just 
we just replace all of our ultrasound machines with with one model, you know, not one particular model, but one vendor to say at least now we're we're cutting out a thousand variables uh, in this process. If we can organize our our purchasing policies, our acquisition policies, and it seems heavy-handed, and I, I I don't personally like uh, that because it'll restrict some of our innovation, but um, there's a price we have to pay for how much time can we spend vetting all this security, and if we can if we can sort of limit the the menu, um, we get we get our hands around it, and and we you know so it's a trade off, and it comes down to the governance, and it comes down to your organizational culture. If if you can pull that off and not have rioting in the streets, uh, I think I think it gets us somewhere where it's a little bit more manageable. Okay, the next and last topic is uh, how to safely retire medical devices and systems. This includes situations where a device is temporarily retired when it's sent for repair and situations where a device is permanently retired and how to remove all protected health information from a device. What are the current approaches to handle this problem? And that's gonna be the last question for Tracy. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, this is a this is a super important topic, and by and large, it's a, a fairly manual process still, right? You you are actually having to physically control the exit of a piece of equipment um, from the building. So where a lot of this stuff is kind of electronic data being tossed around, this is actually um, what we're talking about on a physical device. Um, I'm going to tackle just kind of first the the thought of having to send in a piece of equipment for repair. Um, having that information. Sometimes um, it's important to, you know, have in order for the troubleshooting to happen, the information that's on the device has to kind of stay intact as it goes back to a vendor. So it's really important here. I mean, we talked a little bit about chain of custody, um, but establishing that, making sure all of your BAAs and your data security agreements are in place prior to allowing the piece of equipment to you know, go out. And again, there's some timeliness around it, right? So you got a piece of equipment that's down and is not available um, for repair. The other part is, is actually when the piece of equipment leaves, it's, it's, I guess I would implore everyone here to work within your organization and start taking a look at, at the different ways that uh, devices can leave the organization. You know, they can be traded in, you may have a surplus in salvage, you have something that maybe ends up over in a research, you know, section. So really take a, take a look in your organization and understand that so that you can um, put process in place. And then you're gonna manage to that process um, to make sure that you have a system so that you can remove hard drives, that you can safely and um, have certificate of destruction for the data that, that are on those systems. Um, and put into play. We actually um, hear every month, and you don't think about it a whole lot, but, but you know, we do preventive maintenance every month on equipment, and there are going to be a certain percentage of devices that can't be found um, as you're going through and you're looking at them. And you know, again, that kind of comes back to the whole location um, and integration with other systems being able to find those um, devices. But if you can't, there's, a, there's the possibility that if you look at that piece of equipment and says, oh, it contains EPHI, it becomes a whole new um, piece. And then you know, we just saw in Israel where um, a veterinary clinic took, a, uh, took equipment and they had, they had bought it and, it and the device you know, hadn't. And so that opens up a big organizational risk. Well, thank you. Well, we're pretty much out of time at this point. So this concludes the discussion by our panel. I wish to thank very much all the members of this panel to share their expertise with us today. Thank you, James, Robert, Tracy, and Seth. Thank you, audience, for listening to us and have a good remaining of the forum, everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Benoit. Thank you, Tracy, Seth, Robert, and James. It's always great to, uh, to see you on these, uh, these events. And what a, what a great variety of questions there. So uh, I think we've put the world to right here, or at least uh, we, we know what we need to do, put it that way. So uh, thanks again, everyone. Perfect, thanks, Thank thanks everybody. And also thanks for all the people in the audience with the comments, Leanne uh, and uh, myself, of course. Yes, it's always good to thank myself. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure watching and I look forward to seeing you in the audience.
Great. Well, as we uh, as Sorry about that, Richard. That was me. I think you're moved. Yeah, I was going to say I think someone fat fat fingered it there, but uh, but never that was, mind. That was me. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, and, and and thanks thanks for people in the audience, Thomas. Uh, nice uh, nice comments as well. Uh, yeah. But yes, Richard, what, what a great uh, what a great panel. Um, it's really well, in my experience, it's a bit unusual to get clinicians and people with operational experience to talk about this. So, 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 so it's excellent that you know they were able to spare the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think 